always have great singing in Northern Ireland, and you're singing well tonight. What the pastor said about my singing, I don't know. I'm singing all over the scale. Uh, and uh, I like the man in England, he said he was a very good singer before the tunes came out, <laughs> that is. And uh, it's really a great joy to be here. Friends, I wish to thank you from my heart for your kindness and your welcome this morning. A lovely joy to be once again in Northern Ireland and a lovely joy. I've been a frequent visitor since 1969. And it's a joy always to come and to meet with the Lord's children here. Some of the finest, most committed and godly people, and I say this with carefulness, that I ever worked with were some of the saints here in Northern Ireland. And I don't come from over here. I come from England, right down the leg of England, as they call it, right down in the West Country. But what a joy it is always to visit this dear province. And lovely to be here in the tabernacle. We look to the Lord. May I encourage you to drop things and put things aside for this special week and come to all the meetings you can come to as we tune in night by night to the Word of God and listen to God's tremendous future laid out for us in the Scriptures of Truth. Not your church here, I know, but m many of the churches at home, they, I say they fly on one wing. You know, we need to fly on two wings. And they proclaim the first advent of Christ, but they only fly on one wing. The second advent is not spoken of at all. Well, now, it is lovely to be here. And I've mentioned that I came first in 1969, and I came across the water as a young man. I wasn't married in those days. I had hair. Uh, there's no connection between those two things. Um, and I was a student from Cliff College, the College of Dr. Samuel Chadwick, whose name might be familiar to some of you. He didn't found that college, but he was its most famous uh, principal. And I came across as a young man. I'd have been, I think, 29 or 28 years of age. Maybe 20, yeah, but about 28. And I went to the town of Dungannon. That's a nice town. And the pastor at that time, we, we got on really well as... Uh, it's good to meet your dear pastor, George, and thank God for him. And I like the fire in his ministry and, and his life, and we praise the Lord for him. And I was with a pastor in those days, and the first night we went home for supper. The Northern Ireland people are great at suppers, and they like the suppers. And I, I, I'll vote for that any time. I go along with it. I'm not against it. I'm, I'm voting for it uh, when we come over here. Um, and he had a, a, two boys. I think I've got it right. Yes, there were two. One of them became quite famous. And I'm not going to give his name out here, but you'll know him. He's on the television uh, because he's up in Stormont. And his daddy says to him, uh, Jonathan, stand up on the chair. Uh, Mr. Passmore comes from England. And he's never heard a little boy from Northern Ireland singing. Come on, stand up on the chair and sing a song from Sunday school. And he put his little boy up. I don't know how old he was, maybe seven or eight, something like that. He stood the little boy up to sing to the Englishman, sing something really good. And the little boy squared his shoulders and he sang the sash. <laughs> Boys, I never knew. us a poor man from England going to make of that. I never knew anything about the sash. But that's what he sung. And uh, we thank God for that young man. He's risen up through uh, various channels, and we thank the Lord for him. And his dear father still alive, his mother with the Lord. And through the years, we've had lots of lovely and sweet associations with, with uh, God's people here. So do try and come all you can. Lay things aside if you can. Um, and come all you can, night by night, until Friday is our closing night. We'll be going through quite a number of subjects. And tomorrow evening, we have a very interesting and very up-to-date subject. I'm going to speak from the book of Ezekiel. The Hebrew prophets speak today the Word of God. And we're going to look in Ezekiel 38 as we dwell upon the theme, and I hope to bring the case before you, um, of Russia, Islam, and the return of Christ. It is amazing, the prophecies of the, the Old Testament prophets who pro, pro, prophesied into the future of the very days that you will see on your television screens this week. It's on all the time now, and uh, some very, very interesting things. And I do invite you warmly to come. 
night by night, and especially perhaps tomorrow. Now this evening we're going to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, which commences what we call the Olivet Discourse. We call it that as believers because the Lord in verse 3 was sitting on the Mount of Olives. So we sort of uh, christened it the Olivet Discourse or the Mount of Olives Discourse. He's speaking privately to his own disciples and we take up the narrative in verse 3. Matthew's Gospel, please, friends, uh, chapter 24 and we're at verse 3. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, uh, Hebrew teachers, Jewish teachers, still always teach sitting down. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, and friends in your Bible, if you're following in the Scriptures, will you note that they asked him three leading inquiries. Number one, tell us when shall these things be? Number two, what shall be the sign or the signal of thy coming. And number three, they inquired, and of the end of the world, or the close of the age. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences, that is, pandemic diseases and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And if you go down the chapter, please, to verse um, 11. Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold, wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, it means he who can survive through that awful period, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, the Savior seems to underline that. He says, whoso readeth, let him understand something important in there. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him that is in the field return back to his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child, them that are, uh, give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation. If you want to just pause there at that word tribulation in the Greek Bible, the New Testament, there are definite articles in there. The world has always known tribulation, and through much tribulation we will enter the kingdom. But here is something on a different level. There are definite articles, literally tribulation, then will be tribulation the great one, capital G, capital T, it's very important. Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be, and except those days be shortened, there would no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. And then will you go down please to verse uh, 29. Immediately after, it means at the conclusion, immediately of the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn when they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect in that period, from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So likewise ye, when ye see all these things, know that it, but Luke puts, he wrote, he is near, 
even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation, this people, this stock or race shall not pass till all these things shall be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And there we break off reverently the reading of that great uh, chapter of 51 verses. I want to say something quickly to you. Um, first of all, this, is, uh, this chapter is very much a Jewish chapter, as the Gospel of Matthew is very much the Gospel to the Jew. Each of the Gospel writers, the Synoptists and John, they wrote of the one Gospel, but they gave to our Divine Lord a different portrait. And the portrait that Matthew, or Levi as his real name is, wrote, was very much the gospel to the Jew. There is no other, none of the other gospels have so many Old Testament references as this one. And this chapter 24 of Matthew, often spoken of, often too misunderstood, as I've done in the past, and my understanding on these things is not perfect yet. But friends, I submit to you that this chapter is very, very much to do, and this helps our thinking and understanding, is very much to do with the Jew in the tribulation. Uh, why do I say that? Now, we haven't time just here, but when you get home, if you want to study this chapter on your own, you will find, I think, at least six direct references that make this not firstly for the Christian church, not for believers like us, but the primary application of it is to Israel. For instance, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. We don't keep the Sabbath. We're not Sabbatarian. We hold to the Lord's Day and so on. You can tease out six pretty strong reasons that give us a clue. Uh, one of the main um, principles of biblical understanding and interpretation is always context. Always check the context and let the context arbitrate and decide the meaning of what you're reading in the Word of God. And then at the end of the chapter, we haven't time to study it tonight, you have the taken and the left. Remember the Lord Jesus told the parable, two people in a field, two men in a field, one taken and one left. Two grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. Two in a bed, probably man and wife, one taken and one left. Uh, what is he speaking of? Does this, because it's at the end of the chapter and at the end of the tribulation prophecies that the Lord Jesus gives, does this indicate to us that the tribulation will end with the rapture? The rapture will happen at the end of the tribulation and not as classic dispensational Christians have taught, and I teach the classical position is pre-tribulational rapture, but the saints will not be forced to go through the wrath, will not go through the great tribulation. So why is the taken and the left at the end of this chapter and at the close of the Lord's teaching? Well, I don't want to spend time on this, but the word taken, if it meant the rapture would be harpazo, we'll, we'll come to that one night, or harpazo, the rapture when the earth will be evacuated, every Christian will be gone. It'll be a global sensation. I think that may be Tuesday or Wednesday. Don't miss it. Friends, it's coming. The world is being prepared for it. I believe that heaven is being prepared for it too. And we've got to be prepared for it. But the word harpezo is not the word used at the end of Matthew's Gospel. It's the Greek word paralambano. It refers to being taken in judgment. So we may use the taken and the left as a kind of an illustration of the rapture, but it's not what it's about. And how important it is that we understand Matthew 24, its context, is the Jew in the Great Tribulation, as Jesus called it. The Great Tribulation has ten awesome names. It's called the Day of the Lord and many other things. But the Lord Jesus gave it its most well-known name. Friends, as we think of the signs that they inquired of to Jesus. What will be the sign of thy coming? Will there be a signal? Will there be something that will flag up? Christ is coming soon. Now we're taught as believers to 
Always be ready for the coming of the Lord. The New Testament doctrine of imminency. The return of Christ is certain sometime, possible anytime, and imminent all the time. Was it Augustine who said, we don't know the date when he will come, but as he says here, that day and hour knows no man. And I'll come to it for just a second now. Of that date, of that time and hour knoweth no man, not even the angels of heaven, the Lord Jesus said. I think it was Augustine, he said, that day lies hid, that every day we be on the watch. That's the message of the New Testament. Perhaps today, perhaps today, he may come, and that is to cleanse us, purify us. It is to fire our witness, to take the gospel to a lost and deluded world. Yes, they asked of him of the signs of the time. Well, now, the Lord Jesus tells us uh, told the disciples in verse 36, and I've mentioned it very clearly, and we read, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So if a guy comes along with the Bible in his hand, he can tell you the day of the rapture or when the Lord's coming, he can't be of the Lord. Of that day and hour no man knows. The day lies hid. I like the preacher, he said, we have the data. But we don't have the date. It's good. We have the message of it, but not the timing of it. The Lord says he will come in his time. But here is a strange thing. If you like, turn back in your Bibles to Matthew 16 and verses 1 to 3. Not far, in your, far back in your Bibles. Matthew 16, verses 1 to 3. Here is a, an apparent contradiction. You will know that there are no contradictions in Scripture. If the Bible contradicted himself somewhere, it couldn't be the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But here is a, we call it a contradiction, a, a paradox, an apparent contradiction. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, tempting him, desiring him that he would show them a sign. There it is, a signal from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, when it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. You, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and, a gener wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there will no sign be given, and so on. So how do we reconcile those two things? Matthew 24, of that day and hour knoweth no man. But here the Pharisees are censored because they did not see and recognize and act upon the signs of the times. And what does it mean, the, the signals? Here the Lord Jesus talks about the weather, and as a little boy, my mother would go out on a Monday morning uh, washing day, and she would take a look at the sky like this. You don't know all about that. This in Northern Ireland, no good doing any washing today. The sky's wrong. And then when I was a little boy too, they used to say, red sky at night, shepherd's delight means a good day tomorrow, usually. What are we doing? We're reading the future. We're reading the signs of the times of the days. We can foretell the weather tomorrow. Now Jesus said to the Pharisees, you can discern the weather, but you cannot see the signals of what is happening. You don't understand that I am the Messiah, and he censored them for that. So where does this lead our conclusion? Of that day and hour knoweth no man. Ah, but there will be signs. There will be signals. There will be things that will happen in, on planet Earth that should set the world on alert. There will be a signal, or many signals, and signs. And uh, the Lord Jesus deals with these signs. Now, a little word for us this evening. Actually, biblically speaking, as believers, those of us here who know and love Jesus Christ tonight, we're not actually looking for signs. They're not really for us. We are taught throughout the New Testament to expect at any moment the, the trumpet sound, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and we're expecting any moment to be taken 
on a trip, a wonderful uh, trip into outer space where we're going to meet Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. A mass flight into space, and it could happen in a second, and it, in the twinkling of an eye, and it could happen for every moment, at any moment. So I'm taught to anticipate the coming of the Lord to take away His church, and the signs are not really uh, my business. But the Lord Jesus Christ did say, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, your redemption. And in the Greek New Testament, you're loosing away is drawing nigh. Maybe we will see just the beginning of those things. I like the preacher, he said, we're not looking for signs of the time, we're listening for the sound of the trumpet. Good preaching, isn't it? I wish I said that. And that was another preacher. So actually, we're not looking for those signs. Now look, let's look at some of the signs. The Lord Jesus said, of that day and hour knows no, knoweth no man, but there will be signals. And how can we reconcile that? With the statement of that day and hour knoweth no man. Well, I always say to students uh, where I go to teach, next month, God willing, I'll be in Cape and Ray Bible School with 200 wonderful young people there, half of them from America, Canada, and I teach the end times to them. Um, I always liken it with young people to the conception and birth of a little baby. Now, I had, we, my dear wife and I, we had our little babies a good many years ago. Our children are grown away now, and now we have the grandchildren. Isn't it lovely when the grandchildren come for the day? And isn't it lovely when they go home again as well? You need a big cup of tea when the grandchildren have gone home again. <laughs> The youngsters, they get married. You, you older people like my age, yeah, the, it's lovely, the wedding day, and they get married, and sometime later, uh, they come into the front room, and it goes a little bit like this, not always. Mom and Dad, we have an announcement to make. Oh, oh, straight away, your head's going. We're going to have a little baby. Ah, oh, wonderful. Everyone is so excited. Another baby in the family. Next question, this is how it all goes everywhere. Next question, when is the baby due? Now, everybody in the home knows, every mother here knows, that actually of that day and hour when that little baby will come, the new life will come into the world. What a wonderful thing, a new life. But friends, nobody, not even the biological parents of the baby know. The doctor may examine the mother and say the baby is going to be late. They say the baby might be early. One thing is sure, the baby will come. But here is a great lesson. Every mother here in the congregation tonight knows this, that just before a little baby is born into the world, the mother will undergo painful contractions, labor pains, and the harder those contractions come, the more those unpleasant signals come, the closer the wonder of new birth is. Did you know that's exactly what the Lord Jesus is saying and preaching in verse 8 of Matthew 24? See verse 8, what he says here. In the 8th verse, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Maybe you have another translation. All these are labor pains. What does Christ teach us here? It teaches us that in the run-up to his glorious world return, the world will undergo painful signals, labor pains. They're not nice. They're unpleasant. They're painful. The world will undergo great tribulation and sorrow and trouble. Ah, but the good news is beyond that time will be the return of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look quickly then at one or two of the signs. Verse, 30, verse 32, please, to verse 33. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Here the Lord Jesus is, they'd asked him, what will be the sign of your coming? And he's giving them some of the signs. A parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. And we say, 
And many do say in church, what on earth is the budding fig tree? Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Learn a parable of the fig tree. What on earth is the fig tree about? Well, let me say to you, dear friends here tonight, when the Lord Jesus spoke here in his sermon on the mount and he mentioned the fig tree, straight away everyone in his congregation knew what he was preaching about. He was talking about his own nation, the Jewish nation. Because the Jewish people in the Old Testament are spoken of as three kinds of trees. We haven't time to study them this evening. And the fig tree is the nation, the national life of a nation. And the Lord Jesus elsewhere teaches about this, the branch coming back into life, tender. Ever you see the fig tree budding? It looked as though that tree was dead, done for. The Jewish people, was them finished? They're out of the picture. They've got, God's got no purpose for them. But if ever you see that nation, the nation of Israel budding back into life, if you ever see that nation reborn and the fig tree nation budding back into life, know that the coming of the Lord is near. And some preachers say that the nation of Israel is God's super sign to an unbelieving world that the imperishable Jew who stands by the grave of all his enemies is back in the land. As the Bible always said, they must come back into the land. And they're gathering back into the biblical land of promise, the land given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as an everlasting and unconditional land in which they would live. It's their homeland. God gave that land to them. Not even their sin could cancel the Abrahamic covenant. They went into Babylon, 70 years, but they always, they were to come back into the land. It still belonged to them. They didn't have to live in that land to own it. It still was owned by them. 2,000 years, the Jewish people were out of the land. But at the beginning of the last century, and then, of course, in 1948, a nation was born. If you go to the land of Israel, it's a very sad land. Friends, I, I, I just submit this to you to think about. I, I believe that Satan's underworld tonight is frantic over many things. The Bible says in Revelation 12, Satan has great wrath. Why? Because his time is short. He knows what many of the church doesn't seem to know. Time is running out. The Lord is coming. And so Satan's underworld is pouring violence and killing, invective and anti-Semitism because the demons of hell know if you can destroy the Jews, you can destroy the plan of God to bring the world back to himself and to reconcile everything to him. And that's the battle of the Middle East. That'll be on your television this week. Friends, this is right up to date. We're not looking for the signs of the Lord's coming. We're looking at them. And since 1948, that nation was reborn, of course, in unbelief. They don't know the Lord. It's a, a nation in sin. We know that. It's what the prophet Ezekiel said. They would be restored to the land, bone to his bone, but there would be no breath in them. And then the Spirit of God breathed upon them, and they stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. The Bible teaches that the Jewish people will be restored first to the land, and later to the Lord. The purpose of the tribulation is to bring them there. Now then, I want you to see another sign, and I'll hurry, it's in verses 37 to verse 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not they lived in willful ignorance of God's ways. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Here we have the sign. We looked at the sign of the reborn nation of Israel. Here we have the sign of global violence. And I'm going to ask you please to move on quickly to the third one, which is in verse 15. Back in verse 15. Matthew 24. 
Sign number three that I call your attention to. There are many, but we've only time for, for a few. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him that is on the house top not come down to take anything out of his house and so on. What is the sign of the abomination of desolation? Now, we don't have time to go into this deeply, but friends, this is the sign of coming global government. Coming global government. We would need to go into the book of Daniel and in the teachings of Jesus and in the teaching of the inspired apostle, the world is headed for globalism. Global control, global money, global finance, a, gl a global church, and we're not to be a part of it. Everything global, a worldwide thing. There will come a one world government and a one world president, a super politician who the Bible warns will rise. He's just a man, Revelation 13, his number is the number of a man, and he comes up out of the sea of humanity. He's just a man, born like you and me, but he will be a man indwelt with occultic intelligence and force, so that he will command the governments of the world. Perhaps he will come at a great financial collapse. The whole world is living in debt. We're in debt. The greatest debt a nation on earth is America. One day it's all going to collapse. It can't go on. We know this. Perhaps it will be that that will bring this man to prominence. And the world that did not love Jesus Christ will love the devil's Christ. The Lord Jesus said in John, forgive me, is it chapter 8? He says, I came in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. Another will come, another Messiah. He will come in his own name, and him you will receive. We will study that one night, global finance and global government. So what is the abomination of desolation? Well, in the book of Daniel, the coming world antichrist will set himself up in a rebuilt Jewish temple. And the Jewish people haven't had a temple for 2,000 years, since 70 AD, but they're getting one ready. They're getting one ready, even the priests' garments, the instruments of worship. They're doing it, of course, in unbelief. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're getting ready. Messianic expectation is going high in, in Islam. Uh, they're not expecting our Messiah, but the third imam, but it's also in Judaism. And we need Messianic expectation in the church as well. But friends, they're getting it ready and they're going to build a temple. And in that temple, the coming world antichrist will perform an act of terminal blasphemy. He will declare himself God. It's happened in history before. Caesar worship. I think the emperor of Japan claims to be divine. Um, and he will deify himself in that rebuilt Jewish temple, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we will look into that one night, most certainly. And when he does that, the Jewish people will know they have backed the wrong Christ. And they will have to run, all right, because he will come for them. And that's the abomination of desolation. It's a big mouthful. I was up all night practicing to get ready for you. The abomination of desolation. Listen. The, the secret of that is there's a name in there, a noun, the abomination of the desolator. That's what it means. The abomination of the desolator, the Antichrist. And friends, right here in the United Kingdom and across the nations of Europe, we are being prepared for that man to come. Control is his game, and the world will be drawn under that global control. Personally, it's my faith, I believe we won't be here when he rises and when he comes and steps out onto the world scene and assumes control of governments and the media and the world will follow him. I believe we'll be away, we'll be out of here, but 
Some think we will go through it. Some think we'll go through half of the tribulation. Others think we'll go through all of the tribulation. Some think it's preachers like me that put the saints through great tribulation. I know that as well. <laughs> but friends, how wonderful to know that God is in control. We have time for just one more. And it isn't in the Gospel of Matthew. It's in Luke's Gospel. Will you turn quickly, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. Gospel as recorded by Luke, chapter 17. And I'll hurry. Luke chapter 17, and we're at verse 28. We read in Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, uh, violence filled the earth. But look here, Luke 17 and verse 28. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded, Friends, nothing wrong with all of that. It was just they left God out. Business as usual. You don't need God in your life. You go about your life building and planting and sowing and marrying. And give. Yeah, but you just don't bother with God. That's it. Secularism. Leave God out entirely. And so they did all these things. Verse 29, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. Now, there's a very interesting Bible word. At name. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Something that happened in Sodom that brought the anger and retribution of a holy creator God upon the ancient world. What was that? The last sin before judgment. Let's read on. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And as we reverence and respect the inspired utterances of our divine Lord Jesus Christ, I want to talk about something for a minute or two I don't like to talk about. I don't want to talk about this. But what was Sodom? What was Gomorrah? What were those cities of the plain? Why did such a terrible judgment come? So terrible that many believe that the basin, that is the Dead Sea, certainly Sodom and Gomorrah was down there somewhere. And the pillar of salt that uh, his wife, Lot's wife, looked back and turned into a pillar of salt and it says, remember Lot's wife. Don't forget, here is a deep lesson from history. Many believe that that lowest place, you'll know that the Dead Sea in the land of Israel is the lowest place on the spot of the earth. That was created, uh, uh, we, we would say, a, a, a chasm created to burn out the disease that was in Sodom and Gomorrah, to burn out the endemic sexually transmitted diseases, to cleanse the, the, the earth in, the, in those days. And that many believe that is so. Friends, I can't say that's true, but that many suggest that. That's why Sodom is down in that great dip, the lowest point on the surface of planet Earth. So what is the Lord Jesus teaching here? Friends, I don't want to talk about it, but Sodom and Gomorrah was the original gay community. The original one, it, it, it predated, that practice predated Sodom and Gomorrah. But it was there that sin was elevated, the sin of sodomy was glorified, normalized, paraded. And you remember Abraham, and you remember what happened, Genesis chapter 19. Here was the original gay community know for sure that when that comes to planet earth, the ancient sins of that period come, the coming of the Lord is very near. Homosexuality, lesbianism, the last step before judgment. I'm saying that in your pulpit tonight. I think in a few years' time, I'll have to go to prison for saying it. It's the top of Obama's political agenda top of Mr. Cameron's political agenda. He's going to spread it. It's the proudest moment he's got, he said. He's more proud of that than anything else, and he's going to spread it throughout the world. 
What's going on? Why does every politician of the Western world want to promote childless sexuality? What is going on? Friends, I submit to you tonight, this is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. You see, on every level of human existence, including the level of human sexuality, everything points to the return of the Lord, that He is coming. And when we preach this, people say, well, doesn't God love these people? Well, of course He does. We're all sinners. God loves us all. I'm a sinner. Thank God I'm a saved one, a redeemed one, a forgiven one. I'm still not the man I should be. Praise God, I'm not the man I used to be. And I'm not the man I'm going to be. We're all sinners. But because God loves us, we mustn't run away with the thought that He loves everything we do. And I may shock some of you when I say that my dear wife and I, when she was alive, we had particularly our first pastorate among the lovely servicemen in the city of Plymouth, sailors and soldiers. We worked among them and had so many, many hundreds brought to Jesus Christ. You know, we dealt with these people. They would be in our home. We loved them. Most of them were trying to escape the tragedy of it and the guilt of it and the perversion of it. Friends, I'm not going to dwell upon this. I hope that you're getting the message. Everywhere we look today, signs are that Christ is coming soon. And the Lord Jesus spoke of that dominant sin, the last sin, I'm repeating myself, the last sin that God put up with was the perversion of the sacredness of God-ordained human sexuality, the beauty and the intimacy of married love. Listen, marriage is God's heaven-drawn picture of the union between Christ and His church. The church is called the Bride of Christ. The other is a blasphemy against it. Friends, we're living in desperate days when we're being taught. And what I hate so much is that the first place they're going to preach it is in the schools to so the little children, primary schools, children five to seven in this age of so-called inclusivism and equality. Well, now I've finished. There are many other signs to follow, but I want you to turn that we could have studied 1 Peter chapter 1, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're at verse 15. And I'll leave you with these lovely thoughts. 1 Peter 1 and verse 15. And when you found 1 Peter 1, 15, would you please look up at me a moment? I'm sorry you got to look at an old man. <laughs> I'm older now than I've ever been. <laughs> uh, years ago, I used to say, look up, and look up. Then there's a lovely look up at a young man. I'm afraid I'm not a, young man, not a young man anymore. I'm an old man. A dear old lady in my church in Bradford in Yorkshire, somebody said to her, Maggie, you, you live in an old rickety house these days. I think she was 90-something. Well, I not quite got there. But she lived in an, this is Maggie, you live in an old rickety house these days. She was complaining about her aches and pains. Aye, she says, but I have a great view from it. Amen. She's looking on to the glory. Not long to go. I'll soon be home, an old rickety house, but I have a great view from it. I like that. And uh, how wonderful it was. Just look up for a moment. Tonight, the most important thing on earth is that you know that you're saved. That you know that Jesus Christ has redeemed you by His blood. That you're washed in the blood of the Lamb and that you're heaven-born and heaven-bound. That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing, friends. I think it was W.P. Nicholson. What a wonderful preacher he was, one of my heroes. He looked out over a big congregation once. He says, some of you have been washed white, and others are only whitewashed, he says. <laughs> that's, that's, that's powerful preaching. That's, a, that's straight between the eyes, isn't it? And I was whitewashed. I went to Sunday school, and I went to church sometimes, not very often. My mother used to send me to Sunday school, and the pastor used to say, good boy. And my grandma used to say, good boy. And my aunties used to go like this on Sundays. That's why I'm a bit thin up there, you see. They used to say, good boy. 
But I had to come to that time when I knew that I was a sinner and Christ had died, took my place upon the cross. Make sure you're saved and ready for the future. That's the most important thing. But a little verse I want to share with you in, in closing. Here, here we go. 1 Peter 1 verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Conversation means your daily life, your lifestyle. Because it is written, and it is three times in the Old Testament, one time here, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Before I let you go, think for a moment. God says to us, to me, to you, be ye holy. There is one aspect of the divine attributes of God that he longs for you and me as children to share. We all long for our children to follow our example. We, we should do. And God longs for his children to resemble him. But he doesn't say, be ye omnipotent, even as I am omnipotent. He might have said that. To share the divine attributes of omnipotence. He doesn't say that. He doesn't, doesn't want us to be able to do all that God can do. He doesn't say, be omniscient. He might have said, I want you to know all that I know. But he doesn't long for us to resemble him in the attribute of omniscience. There's one thing alone that he longs for us to resemble him in, and that is in his holiness. And there are more references to God's holiness than any other of his attributes in Scripture. Be ye holy. It means separate. Set apart. Live a life for him. Not for yourself, not for the world, but to live a life separated unto him. We are called unto holiness. And in these last horrible closing days, as the world moves on, and the long shadows of the tribulation are beginning to fall over global societies and over Br British society and the society here in this dear province, my friends, we must live closer to the Lord than ever before and love him, worship him, and live for him. And isn't he worth it? Let's sing our closing hymn. It's the hymn number 